Um, yes. Um, thank you, Luisa. It's very nice to be here and to try to sum up uh, the history of biology, uh, the science, and the history of life on Earth in one hour, approximately. So 3.5 years of history um, in one hour. So the, the biology is the study of life. And uh, if I ask you to think about what is life, uh, I think most of you will uh, think of something like this. A bunch of animals, some plants, uh, and all the reactions, and uh, re reproduction, and things like that. But it's also um, uh, a sort of hidden world that most of you haven't seen before. So this is one, one cell, actually. It's a Quellomyxa. It lives in the soil. Uh, or a more famous amoeba they might have seen pictures of. These are microscopic, you can see them. So how is it that we come to uh, discover them and describe them if they are so small and so innocuous that we can't, be, we can't really see them with the naked eye? Um, more examples of uh, small marine uh, animals. These are about one tenth of a, of a millimeter. Some of them I study. So these guys here I study. And, uh, it's uh, um, in the upper right corner. Even though it's just one single cell, it can swim. Um, but life can also be even smaller, like the bacteria. But the thing is that this is really just a variation of one theme. So everything that we can see that lives on Earth right now is a variation on one thing, the cell. So there are cells, and the cells develop, and, are, and they take different uh, directions. So uh, in this uh, um, the wheel here, and this is a tree of life, of the eukaryotic life, excluding bacteria this time. You can sh see some of the diversity of what's out there. So we are down here. We are animals. Uh, we have the land plants, the green plants here, and seaweeds and things like that, and, uh, that there. But the total diversity is much, much more than the large multicellular organisms. So down here you have almost exclusively uh, single-cell organisms, and, but all of them are variation of one thing, the cell. Um, here is a modern picture of uh, cell. This is cell culture, mammalian cell cultures. And we have highlighted the uh, cytoskeleton structures that keep the integrity of the cell. It's green. Uh, and also the red one. And the blue one is the uh, nucleus of the cell in which lies the infamous double helix DNA. So uh, the variation in cells are controlled by DNA. All living things on Earth have the same, uh, more or less, uh, mechanism that controls and uh, sort of have the layout for how the cell is going to be, and that's the cell uh, DNA, sorry. Um, I will try not to be too uh, detailed and uh, do too much uh, uh, hard science there, but uh, I just want to tell you that there is a pathway from the DNA double helix to complicated uh, amino acid chains. Uh, amino acid chains, they fold on top of each other like 3D structures and they make up proteins. So from DNA, to proteins, several different proteins come together. They form um, uh, form structures like this. These are one of those uh, cytoskeleton formations that you saw earlier. So a lot of different proteins stacked upon each other uh, control the integrity of the cell. <coughs> so how did we find out all this? How could we get down to the uh, one millionth of a, um, uh, of a millimeter to see the resolution of the cytoskeleton that we just saw. This is a plot of the uh, say normal range of sound frequencies out there, sound and waves, and the electromagnetic spectrum. And if we plot what we can hear from about 20 to 20,000 hertz, and the small range from 250 to 700 nanometers, uh, we are Basically blind and deaf. 
So we have relied upon different instruments to help us, for instance, the microscope, and we'll come back to that one. And also uh, methods to investigate nature. So in a way, we have gone from the uh, mythological, uh, religious way of looking at nature, where you have, this is a Thor uh, tool, uh, reaching uh, across the sky, throwing his hammer and creating lightning and thunder. So that's the old, or superstitious, religious view. Why do you have um, Benjamin Franklin there, who flew a kite <coughs> into the air, and he attached metals to the string, and he observed that lightning was uh, uh, electricity. And sort of taking it out from the mythological domain and down to um, something that is not controlled by gods. <coughs> okay, so let's take a let's step back and look at the uh, Earth timeline. So the Earth is approximately 4.5 billion years old. The first million or so, uh, there was nothing living on the Earth, but we think that we can see traces of what would be single-celled organism bacteria appearing 3.5 billion years ago. It's hard to see them. They, they are like small uh, dots or droplets inside uh, inside uh, uh, rocks, like fossils, but they don't have any uh, internal structure you can see, so it's hard to say if they really are organisms, but they look like something else than naturally occurring uh, minerals, for instance. There. And the single cell organisms, they, they reign the earth for more than one billion years, and suddenly they come together and started to making multicellular organisms. They started just grouping together in colonies and uh, exchanging nutrients, for instance. Uh, so the first multicellular organisms were really simple, there wasn't much differentiation in these cells. There was only the, um, more, more or less the same type of cells, but they were communicating somehow. And some of these uh, uh, single cell animal cell organisms, they acquired the ability to produce oxygen, ox oxygen from uh, carbon dioxide and water. So photosynthesis um, appeared some two billion years ago and really transformed the uh, atmosphere on Earth from something that would not be uh, uh, habitable for us, but it was turned from uh, carbon, carbon dioxide rich to oxygen rich environments. Mm. So just some uh, photosynthetic uh, organisms. We have the cyanobacteria, which are uh, the original uh, photosynthetic uh, organism. Then you have plants. Um, and plants really acquired this ability uh, by a process where they sort of engulfed the bacteria that could do photosynthesis, and it kept it inside them as a symbiont. So this is one of the really large, biggest events in the uh, history of Earth, called the endosymbiotic event. This one can't do photosynthesis alone, uh, like we, more or less but it ate without devouring or destroying this uh, cyanobacteria. So, then the last thing I'm going to talk about sex. Here's the first evidence of sexual reprodu reproduction, approximately one billion years ago. Um, <coughs> the first animals appeared only 600 million years ago, so animals are kind of uh, young on Earth. Bacteria has a much more longer history. Um, they went from the sea and, uh, up on land 400 million years ago. And then we have humans <coughs> appearing. <coughs> Our earliest ancestors, they are sort of not ape-like, or in between apes and humans approximately seven, six, seven million years ago. So here is a tree, or a, a, a schematic representation of uh, humanoids, hominids on, on Earth, from uh, the earliest one to us here, homo sapiens. 
and you have the Neanderthals, they are quite famous and recognized by people. Um, so in the, in the scope of things, we are really, really just uh, as a flash uh, in, um, in this history. <coughs> Important thing that happened in the, develop, um, in the evolution of humans was the acquirement of, uh, of uh, tools. So it's a sort of uh, first thing of culture. It's um, different, different tribes on different places in, on Earth use different kind of tools. If you look at more uh, modern uh, world or modern civilization, we have the first uh, uh, first evidence of abstract thought some 30,000, 35,000 years ago. <coughs> so I had two pictures. The one is just the outline of a hand. So somebody put this hand up on the on the, um, the cave wall and traced around it, uh, and somebody was also able to, you know, to, draw, you know, to draw pictures of the herds and the cattle uh, out in the field that were hunting. So this is the first time we see that uh, humans were able to think abstractly about the world around them. They might have been earlier, but yeah. Um, some 10,000 years ago, we learned how to domesticate cattle um, and uh, grains. So we set them down in, uh, in uh, cities. And when you settle down in a city, you can start to divide, uh, divide labor. You don't have to find your own food. You can, you can get farmers to grow grains, or you can get uh, somebody else to buy it for you. <laughs> so uh, there's really time to do other things like uh, um, I don't know, developing a language, written sorry, language. Mm -hmm. So you can start to write down things, what you know, what you experience, and often what kind of uh, grains and cattle you want to buy for. Uh, sort of household keeping of your your uh, your stocks. Uh, <coughs> but also, and here is probably the first written things that start to look like biology. It's uh, and this paper is here that contains uh, a list of uh, herbs that would um, help against different diseases and things like that. And you have the first. Physician uh, in Optech who was uh, uh, where he um, was able to to uh, treat the, uh, several injuries. Injuries. It's the first time we know of that has written down all the kind of injuries he he was treating. So this these are the first phys physician anatomists. <coughs> And now to the cradle of Western society, uh, civilization. I'm not going to talk about what's happened in uh, the Arabic and Islamic world because that would take too long. But uh, sort of the cradle of the, uh, the Western civilization is ancient Greece. Um, they are still in a state where they think that the gods are the, the reason behind diseases, for instance, and, and uh, how seasons uh, evolve. And, uh, um, and uh, when they speculate about what the world is made of, they think that, uh, uh, well, there's, there's actually, I said it's necessary that uh, they think that's four basic elements, but there, there was uh, several different ideas. They have um, Talus, he said that uh, the, the earth, or the, sorry, the world is made of different kinds of water, and you have uh, other ideas, but the one that sort of, sort of hang around for several hundred years was the idea that the world is made of four different basic elements. Earth, air, water, and fire. But there, it's very much the gods that still control how those elements are put together. So this is Helios, uh, the sun god, who the, is responsible for pulling the sun over the sky. Um, I have to mention a couple of the old philosophers. Uh, Aristotle, one of them. Uh, Hippocrates, the, another one. Uh, Hippocrates, of course, famous for being the, uh, the godfather of uh, medicine. Um, and the change with Hippocrates uh, from previous times is that he's probably the first one who's uh, questioning the idea that, for instance, diseases are uh, put upon humans by the gods. So he thinks that uh, diseases are naturally occurring and you can do something to cure them 
besides uh, slaughtering a lamb or whatever you want to do to appease your gods. Aristotle uh, also uh, was perhaps the first uh, biologist in the sense that he studied uh, nature, not only humans, but he tried to cat catalog uh, um, living things, animals and plants. So he did it based on similarity. Remember, there's no idea of evolution back here. Uh, no idea of her hereditary genes or something. All of those are new um, ideas or new discoveries. So, but he, he, he can group things based on similarity. So things with four legs are more similar than things with two legs, for instance, or something what we will call superficial now. Um, <coughs> the ideas of Aristotle uh, spread throughout the Roman Empire. Um, and there was, um, yeah. Um, it, so that's why I have to mention him because it, it stuck around for five, six, seven, eight hundred years. Uh, but there were other things that happened in the Roman Empire as well. Uh, this is a, a sort of first encyclopedia of uh, of uh, the natural world. It uh, has both uh, astrology and mineralogy and zoology and botany. So it's 37 volumes trying to describe everything around uh, what's happening from Linus the Elder. Um, but uh, Galen, he was uh, uh, expanding on Aristotle's idea of how the human anatomy works. So he tries to uh, correct some of the faults that uh, Aristotle uh, had, uh, was uh, responsible for spelling. So Aristotle thought, for instance, that the head was only uh, a refrigerator for the blood. <laughs> so he doesn't, didn't think that we had cognitive abilities in the head, but rather the heart. And it was based on the fact that they could see that the heart was one of the first organs that developed in fetuses. And also, the heart is much warmer than the, uh, the, than the head. And he reasoned that, OK, um, when you're thinking, it has to be connected to fire, to, to, to heat. So if the head is uh, cooler than the, the heart, then okay, the heart is the seat of the soul. Um, Gollum, he said, no, that's wrong. He was able to figure out that cognitive ability resided in the brain. His idea of uh, how the different organs were put together was that food traveled to the liver. Um, Together with earth and uh, with the 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 air we it's mixed into different kind of spirits. So you have the vital spirit and the natural spirit that sort of um, gives your life through your blood. It's mixed this air mixed with food basically. It travels to the brain where you get the animal spirit, which is the sort of reasoning, the seat of reasoning, and how you are able to reason. <coughs> and Gaul's view would uh, be persistent for. A uh, long time through into the Middle Ages. Uh, what he did uh, contain from Aristotle or, or from the old Greeks was the idea that there are uh, four elements. So this is uh, a picture of uh, how they are related. So you have air, fire, earth, and water. And if you combine them in different ways, if you are, for instance, hot <coughs> and wet, then you have um, blood, which is related to air, and, and if you have, if you are hot and wet, or if you have a fever, then you probably have too much blood. So that is how they started to drain blood uh, <laughs> to alleviate uh, fevers. Um, yeah, and there's, there's a table there with other how the um, central organs and how the elements are connected together. <coughs> Turning into the mid Middle Ages, and the so-called Dark Ages, where, um, which is kind of, uh, I don't like that name. A lot of, lot of things happened in the Middle Ages. It's not uh, a period of, uh, of just darkness and bleakness. Um, one thing, for instance, is uh, alchemy. Uh, OK, they were wrong. Alchemy doesn't work. <laughs> you can't create uh, gold out of anything, or you can't find the Philosopher's Stone that is supposed to cure all diseases, but they were uh, really good at measuring things. So it's a sort of uh, alchemy is the start of uh, chemistry. It's the same word, al alchemista. So you just remove the al and you have chem uh, chemistry instead. Um, 
here is Paracelsus. Uh, most likely he's uh, able to get sulfur out of urine or something like that. So a yellow substance, of course, it resembles gold, so we have to play with that to see if we can get gold. <laughs> um, and also in the Middle Ages, the first universities appeared. So 1088, University of Bologna. Um, universities were back then uh, organized in a very different way than they are now. So instead of uh, being a place of learning where people would come and take courses like we do now, it was a place where people, they, they met and they hired professors, or not professors, they hired teachers to teach them things. So it was more driven by the students than by the, uh, the teaching faculty. And the first thing they learned in the, or studied in these kind of universities uh, was uh, medicine, law, mathematics, things like that. And another thing, they, they were also independent of the rulers very often and of the church. So they could learn things that was not put upon them by the clergy or by the prince or the ruler of a given city. And the idea of the university it caught on quite fast, so it spread throughout, uh, throughout Europe. So after Bologna you have Paris and Oxford and Cambridge and etc. But there was, uh, uh, this is familiar for you, the, the Black Death sort of stopped uh, intellectual production for, its, for a period in, in Europe. Uh, it's estimated that somewhere between 30 and 60% of the population died. So you can imagine that uh, the villages got deserted and things. So it really was a chaotic time. Um, it created both religious and social and economic upheaval. And it had uh, profound effects on the history of Europe. So it, it took some time before Europe recovered. Uh, but of course, he did, as well know. <laughs> Moving on to another um, important uh, technological achievement, not directly re related to biology, but uh, very important anyway, it's the first printing press. So instead of having clerks sitting and handwriting on everything and copying um, uh, Bibles most of the time, you can now print on a I was a large scale and uh, large scale um, enterprise. It's not, but um, yeah, you could start to make copies that were identical, and you uh, could use machines to do it. So <coughs> the printing press, Gutenberg, designed the first one. It was able to print about 150 copies of the Bibles, so not very many, but uh, mm. perhaps more than a rich and small uh, author. I don't know. <laughs> um, When you get into the Renaissance, um, the word Renaissance means uh, awakening, reawakening. So the idea uh, is that you have the sort of black middle, middle ages where little happened, but you have then the reawakening of rationality and logic and the way of uh, reasoning like the old uh, ancient philosophers did. So in this painting here from uh, 15, uh, early 1500, you have uh, both Aristotle and Plato in the middle and other uh, Greek philosophers who were really the heroes from the early Renaissance. Um, and you have the Reformation, uh, the thesis by Martin Luther, which was a uh, uh, re revolt against, against the you know, clergy and the church, so uh, sort of trying to free people from the clergy. Okay, 1543, um, very important year in the history of science. Perhaps the first uh, real uh, scientific works appeared from uh, in, in this year. You have the, um, um, I don't know how to pronounce the Latin, the, on the re revolution of the heavenly spheres by Copernicus, which sort of placed the sun in the middle of the uh, uh, of the solar system instead of Earth, so um, the Greeks knew this, and they had uh, okay. They, it's not that Copernicus was the first to think is think think that the sun was the center of the of the solar system and not the Earth, but uh, he was the first to perhaps argue scientifically that it was. 
Um, the story goes that he actually received the first copy of this book on his deathbed. So he died in 1543, the same year that the book came out. And you also have um, a reworking of human anatomy. So um, Andreas Vesalius, an Italian guy, he, he found out that Galen, we met earlier, 100 years ago, or a thousand years before this, was wrong. So he really questioned both uh, Aristotle and Galen, and he did a lot of um, dissections of human corpses. I don't know if you can see it, but this is a, this is a theater. People are standing around, there's a corpse in the middle. So he got uh, uh, permission to do a dissection of corpses that were just had just recently been executed, for instance. And he made very nice drawings, detailed drawings, and I also like the fact that they are they are doing something. They're like standing up. Um, it's not, uh, not not a clinical version that we have in textbooks these days. Um, and even as we go along here, he um, you can see that here you've removed one layer after another for the skin and then more uh, muscles and there's some of the core muscles left and then you're left with a weeping skeleton standing there naked without any muscles or flesh or skin. And there's another famous one is the thinking skeleton. So. Um, but there was no idea of evolution still. Uh, evolution is the central tenet of biology. Uh, but uh, in the Renaissance and in the Middle Ages and before, there was uh, the idea was that you were given your place uh, in nature, like a ladder-like uh, thing. So it's not very, I think it's less specialism, but in this um, picture you have the devil down, down here and then you have uh, minerals and plants and uh, uh, animals and insects and things like that, and you have humans and angels and gods on the top. And you are placed in, you have your place on the ladder. There's no evolution, there's no uh, going from insects to, towards humans or things like that. So, scala natura was called. Um, one of the technical achievements the one here and the glass lenses. Suddenly, uh, um, scientists were able to make uh, glass lenses that let through a lot of uh, light without interference. And when you do that, you can do things like build a telescope. We will see the microscope later. It took another hundred years, but uh, uh, Galileo he took the telescope um, and he directed it against the moon, and he uh, saw. Um, saw mountains and valleys, for instance, on the moon. And he also uh, looked at Jupiter, and he saw that Jupiter had moons that uh, went around it. So in this table here, you have Jupiter as the sort of big circle, and the small black dots are, are the four moons of Jupiter that um, uh, revolves around it. So he was able to determine sort of uh, how many moons there were and how they moved. Well, not exactly how they moved, but that they moved. Um, he also uh, is famous for these dialogues where he argues the same thing that Coper Copernicus did, that uh, uh, the sun is the center of the solar system, not the earth. We are now into uh, the 1600s, 1700s. Um, René Descartes uh, tried to figure out how the uh, the mental and the physical world was linked. So his idea was that uh, this is a uh, uh, picture of the brain, uh, supposed to be. And in the brain, there are uh, certain openings where it's, you know, that are filled with fluid and not with gray matter. And he thought that there was a pneumatic uh, thing happening in the brain when you, for instance, um, uh, burned your leg. Um, it's like squeezing a tube with water. So if you have a tube with water and you squeeze on one side, it sort of stiffens on the other side. And then the, his idea was that the water sort of traveled up to the brain where you have more fluid there. And that was how the body reacted. Um, 
the mental interacted with the brain through a uh, gland. I don't think you can see it on that picture. So the mental was sort of uh, distinct from the physical. The physical was just mechanics, while the mental was not mechanical at all. It has been a problem for, our, for philosophers for the last 300 years to try to uh, figure out how the mental and the physical can be put together again. So um, I used to, used to study philosophy. I have a, a master's degree in philosophy as well. And what that was my topic back then. I didn't get anywhere, so <laughs> I left and started doing just biology instead. Um, and one thing that's nice with biology that they don't have in philosophy is that we have a scientific me method. Um, Francis Bacon formulated the, the first kind of written down idea of how to do science properly, where you have to rely on facts and not only speculations. So, before this, people had speculated a lot, about, a lot about things, and they had sort of observed things, but they hadn't, they hadn't reasoned in a rigorous, rigorous way. So what uh, um, Francis Bacon said that you have okay, there, there are three steps into the, in doing science. First, you make your observations, and you try to formulate a theory, and you do tests, you do experiments. So experiment was not usual to do before this. Um, Okay, you can't everything you can't test. You can't test, for instance, the, the how many moons there are around Jupiter. But a lot of things you can test. Uh, and he also warned against things that uh, are very common still. I think it is to be led by your own dogma, what you're thinking, you know, what you think is right. So he said, okay, you should be open, uh, and also how uh, normal everyday language language is not really good. Uh, at capturing details when it comes to science. So it's easy to be led, misled by um, ordinary language. So, and speaking of uh, language, I am, this is a small section from, uh, from one of the first books that took uh, alchemy into chemistry. So it's The Skeptical Chemist by uh, Robert Boyle. Um, they had a very nice uh, way of formulate, uh, form, uh, formulating themselves back in the days, I think. So when he wrote about elements, he, he said that they are certain primitive and simple or perfectly unmingled bodies, which not being made of any other bodies or of one another, are the ingredient of which all those called perfectly mixed bodies are immediately compounded and into which they are ultimately resolved. <laughs> which is kind of crystal clear, right? <laughs> Uh, but what he meant that is that there are uh, constituents of the things that make up the world that are elements, which are um, like the atom theory from uh, from old uh, uh, old Greeks. So it's not they're not just floating around, but they are compounds that can react to each other, and they are discrete compounds. Um, and he also describes a lot more than earth, air, wind, and fire, which we have seen in the. Um, sort of uh, important elements before, but he said, uh, no, there, there are many more. Um, I said that the um, microscope would appear a little later than the telescope, but it did. Here's the, uh, um, one of the first compound good microscopes. Um, <coughs> so you put your eye here, you look through a tube of metal copper, copper. Uh, and they have a lens there and a lens there, and you put whatever you're looking at down here, and there's a light going there, so you can illuminate it and what you're looking at. And Robert Hooke did that with this uh, uh, microscope and looked at, uh, for instance, this slice here, made uh, nice uh, detailed drawings of things that have been naked, not uh, been visible to the naked eye before. And he also observed this. This is uh, a plant, cork and he used the word cell for the first time. So before this, nobody had an idea that uh, uh, plants or bodies were made up of discrete entities called cells, but it was more like a floating uh, uh, I don't know, mass or whatever. But he used the word cell, meaning compartment. Um, and this is what you probably saw. This is a, uh, a modern picture of the same or tissue that we looked at. So he saw something like that. Um, 
another one who made a um, different type of uh, microscope. Yes. I don't know how to pronounce this. I think. I don't even know the book. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, he made tiny, really, microscopes. So they're, I you know, size of a credit card or something. Uh, it has a small lens here. And there's a uh, pin that you can uh, attach whatever you're looking at on top. So uh, he was able to see very small things, but he had to make a new microscope for everything he looked at, more or less. So he tried to fix whatever he looked at on top there. So, and it, but it, um, the, the real invention here was how he made the, the, the glass lens. He didn't tell them anybody, anybody how he did it, so nobody was able to replicate the exact way he did it. But, uh, he did see things like uh, single-celled organisms, like the ones I showed you. Uh, quite early, that they in the sea. He took a drop of pond water and then looked at it, and you could see that it was um, uh, many, many organisms floating around it. So think how surprised he was. He had no idea that there is things floating around in the water that's actually living. Uh, so he saw things like organisms and bacteria, and also uh, spermatozoa or sperm. So. This uh, rendering of how sperm looks is that you have the typical tail of the sperm, and then there's a looks like a small uh, small man sitting in the in the head there. So, <laughs> so um, he didn't know they didn't know how reproduction really worked, but they, they probably knew what thing <laughs> what you had to do to reproduce, but not how the actual <laughs> mechanisms mechanisms worked. Um, he saw some uh, bacteria, but viruses are way too small to observe with a light mic uh, microscope. So, um, there are some uh, viruses here. Made, uh, made, uh, the picture is made by electron, electron microscopy in the 50s, the first time we could actually visualize uh, viruses. Um, a couple of hundred years after the MOOC, there was uh, a guy who uh, looked at a lot of different bacteria and classified them into groups, whether they were spiraling or just uh, making lump, uh, lumps, yeah, and, or if they were elongated or not. And he named them bacteria, which means little stick. Um, and it was also somewhere in between the discovery of the first bacteria and this naming here that uh, people start to realize that bacteria is what transmit diseases, for instance, or not the only cause of the diseases, but many diseases are transmitted by bacteria or something that they couldn't see at the time, which then were viruses. Um, very important uh, publication in the history of science is the uh, Naturalis Principia. Uh, Mathematica uh, by Isaac Newton. First time somebody states an univer universal law. So he, um, before the, this, people had described it and they were doing experiment, but it, the the end result was not meant to apply to everything uh, that is uh, well, under all occasions. So he said he has this um, this action and reaction uh, uh, laws, which are universal. They are they apply to everything that has the force. And together with Leibniz, um, um, he developed a branch of mathematics, calculus, um, uh, which make uh, which uh, is the study of change. So it's easy to calculate when you have one thing and you add it to another thing, but if things really change that when you add something you lose some other and there's interaction between two systems, like in this uh, formula here, uh, which is really an interaction between the prey and predator. I'm not going to walk you through the, all, all the details here, but it says something about how the density of predators, predators will uh, affect the density of, uh, of prey, for instance. Uh, it's complicated mathematics and was de developed in the, in the 1600s. Um, speaking of mathematics, um, I always find it kind of funny to think of that the equal sign that we are so familiar with using now. Uh, it was sort of invented or used for the first time 
back in 1557. So this is the original um, uh, writing. Um, Robert Record had uh, written is equal to in this book, and I, I think it was a couple of hundred times before he suddenly says, and to avoid the tedious repetition of these words is equal to. I will set, as I often do in work, use a pair of parallels or Jimovi, which apparently is twins, uh, Jimovi to lines of one length, and then you have the equal sign, uh, because no two things can be more equal. <laughs> so we're sort of tired of writing is equal to. Um, We are now getting into the enlightenment. Um, rationality um, wins over superstition. Um, the scientific method spreads. Uh, um, intellectual uh, uh, skepticism uh, and, uh, and uh, interchange is uh, um, it? The, the, the fashion. Um, and you have things like the uh, encyclopedia and other things like the scientific journal, which became really important. So, um, the end of the uh, 1700s saw two uh, revolutions. One is uh, about humanities and the American and French um, revolution, freedom, equality, and things like that. And you also have the industrial and the chemical revolution appearing at the same time. <coughs> Yeah, as I said, the uh, uh, oxygen is important for plants uh, in photosynthesis. This was uh, confirmed in the early 1800s that it is a chemical process. We were able, they were able to really pull it uh, apart, the entire process. Um, we are now into uh, 19th century. Um, evolution? No, still not. So this very important idea of evolution is uh, they are beginning to speculate that there has to be some change going on, but they think that this is uh, uh, seasonally or circular or something. <coughs> um, species are immutable, so uh, species are created and they do not change. But um, some changes started to happen in the early 1800s. Uh, Lamarck is the, first, uh, the guy who first used the word biology. So in 1809, he said biology for the first time for uh, the study of what he believes. Uh, he had an idea of uh, acquired characteristics. So he, he thought that there were, this is supposed to be a, a, a tree uh, showing the, the relationship between the, uh, the very different organisms. So we have uh, single cell organisms here. The other ones are these, right in areas. Um, going to insects and uh, mollusks for instance, reptiles, and then you have humans at the end. No, no, sorry, not humans. Um, apes at the end there. So there's a, there's a line going between them, but he thought that there were sort of uh, a number of, uh, of um, uh, ideal types of uh, organisms that they started out with and that sort of evolved, not, not that everything had a connection to one origin. And his idea of acquired characteristics for species was that uh, when you have a giraffe who has to uh, stretch his neck to, to, uh, to eat, um, it will pass off um, the acquired uh, length stretching ability or length of his neck to his offspring. We will then keep on stretching and they will sort of pass on that acquired, um, acquired characteristic, characteristic of um, stretching neck. Um, he was probably not right mm. because this is uh, not what uh, we think are going on now. So, on the original species by Charles Darwin is really the, uh, the seminal, the, the biggest, perhaps, um, iconical uh, publication in biology. Uh, this is where Charles Darwin states this or formulates this idea of natural selection. So instead of having uh, characteristics that are, are acquired and passed on to offspring, 
uh, there is uh, a natural variation in the population of organisms and those that are best fit, they survive, and the extremes sort of no, do not. Um, uh, fitness here is measured in the number of offspring. So you can have, um, these are this, uh, one of these uh, objects of study, finches with different sizes of beaks. So you can imagine that in one population we have very many different beak sizes, but some of these beaks are better at, for instance, crushing nuts or um, seeds, while others are better at catching small insects. So depending on, depending on the environment that these live in, this would be more fit than this, or the other way around, if they have seeds or insects as their best, best or um, most, uh, or uh, the food that is most abundant. Uh, and he also made this first uh, phylogenetic tree, we call it now, uh, thinking that there is one origin and everything sort of over there is, and what, uh, everything sort of spreads out of that. So everything is connected, everything has one starting point and everything evolves from one point. This is the original, original copy of the original species. Um, the same year that um, he released the original species, uh, this fossil was discovered. Uh, it's one of the famous um, missing links. It's actually a bird or a dinosaur. So it's the earliest bird, but it has a lot of characteristics that a dinosaur would have. So we, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, I think it's nice that this kind of missing link that people are asking of, the, there are many of them, and one of them was discovered the first, uh, right when Darwin published his original species. <coughs> But how are these um, characteristics passed on from, uh, from parents to their offspring? Uh, Darwin didn't know. This is before we know anything about genes or, or DNA. So uh, Darwin's idea was that cells, which now were uh, described as single entities, they, they sort of, they, they, there's a small part of cells were shed off and were separated from the original cell and they all gathered in the, uh, um, in the reproductive system of that organism, was this idea. Um, he didn't know here exactly how those uh, cells were, were doing that. So there were a lot of speculations. And uh, I have to mention Mendel because he did uh, experiments on uh, pea pods or pea plants. And he could see that different characteristics of the plants were inherited separately. So if you have peas that are uh, round or wrinkled, and you have peas that are um, yellow and green, those can be yellow and green, they can be wrinkled and yellow, but those two separate characters are uh, inherited separately, separately. So they will go down in the family tree uh, in independent ways. Um, <coughs> and the first physical unit for hereditary information um, uh, the first suspect, so, uh, suspect, I would say, was the protein. Uh, as I said uh, in the beginning, DNA makes proteins, which make cells. They now know that cells contain a lot of things, and they were able to separate the different constituents of cells into each other. And they saw that proteins with these large macro, uh, macro um, molecules, and they, th they thought that, okay, uh, um, hereditary, hereditary information has to pass on a lot of information. So we think it's these uh, proteins, they, they can contain a lot of information. So if you compare the simple DNA structure to a complex protein, this is just one of thousands of different proteins. It's easy to be misled and think that, okay, this is, contains more information than this. So they thought that DNA was only a sort of structural thing that kept the, the cell uh, uh, integrity. Um, it also looks kind of simple because it only consists of a couple of small things. Uh, it has a sugar, this is a sugar binding thing. Um, acids uh, are things that binds the molecules together. And there's a phosphate uh, backbone that keeps these together again. And if you measure the amount of these acids, which are really those that contain the information we know about, 
there is almost an equal amount of all of them. So how can they contain information if there is almost the same amount of Gs as it is A's, C's, and C's? Um, however, if you apply some chemical methods to um, to uh, cells that are in the process of dividing, you can clearly see that DNA uh, segregates from one cell to another in a very particular pattern. So it had to have some importance, but they were not quite sure in the late 1800s what it was. So these are just the nucleus of, the, of cells dividing. So it looks like a jumble at first, and then it starts to spread apart. And when you have two new cells, they will have an equal amount of this jumbled together spaghetti. <coughs> um, calculations on how these uh, traits that I said metal could be set were um, uh, inherited separately. Uh, calculations on how they were separated or how they spread throughout the uh, population uh, was done in the early uh, 1920s and 1930s. Statistical methods for calculating how for instance, the yellow will spread more than brown uh, pea pods were done. I'm not going to go through, through that, but it's a very important um, step. They still don't know what they're calculating, but they are calculating something. Um, during the Second World War, there was a group of people that, um, that tried to study the chemical basis of inheritance by taking DNA from one strain of bacteria and putting it into another. So they were able to do that, so you have two strains of bacteria, one of them are uh, nice to us and the other one is deadly, or to mice perhaps, I don't think they it's very long, but uh, <laughs> So you take DNA from the, from the deadly strain and you put it into the nice strain and suddenly that strain becomes deadly as well. So you only take the DNA and nothing else. If you try to do it with other things, it won't work. And then you have this very famous paper from 1953 um, where the structure of DNA uh, is described for the first time. So this is the first paper that has this double helix structure. Before that, just right before that, a month before, uh, somebody tried to describe a triple helix where these bases are on the outside, but it didn't match up with the experiments they did. So 1953. Um, How much? Yeah, this is just the same as before. The fifth is also saw the advent of the commercial computer, which is, is very important for us now. We do a lot of computation on uh, computers to calculate how different um, genes make different proteins. So in the 60s, it was discovered that these GTCAs, that sort of uh, is the uh, template for all the proteins, they are uh, recovered as proteins in a very, a very specific manner. So I'm not going to go through it, but um, from DNA to protein to cell, right? Um, in 1972, the first gene uh, was sequenced. And by sequenced, I mean you have the exact order of A, D, C, and G. Um, and a couple of years later, this is the entire recipe for making a virus, <laughs> a bacteriophage. Uh, looks like this. Um, this is the first bacterial genome. And in 1996, not long ago, we had the first eukaryotic genome, which was a yeast, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It makes beer, or you can make food. Um, you can use it to make uh, bread and things like that. The human genome was completed in 2001. The entire mass of DNA from uh, one human, that is uh, 3 billion ATCG long. And if you put it in a bookshelf, it contains this many volumes of books, normal page, normal size letters. This is the recipe for making a human. <laughs> And the number of DNA sequences that we have now is really exploded. So we are, this is uh, a year against how much DNA available for uh, researchers. So I started doing my PhD here or something. <laughs> so I was lucky that there was a lot of DNA out there. But it uh, has continued to explode because people do crazy things like this. 
they travel around the ocean, around the world, the ocean, and they sample, these are sort of the same uh, microorganisms I showed you earlier, they sample them, they did 35,000 samples, extract DNA and see, and try to find out what is out there, uh, just by looking at the genes. And for humans, we have been doing the same thing now with gut content and trying to understand the interactions between different um, um, microbes in the gut and the humans, and it's kind of very complicated, so we have to have huge computers to be able to do that. So this is from the uh, University of Oslo. There's a, a gigantic computer cluster, several thousand computers talking together. I used that one for my PhD, and I spent 3 million CPU hours since October, which is about 350 years. So if I had done the calculation of this machine, it would stand there for 350 years to do it. <laughs> Yeah. So I close up with this slide. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the Thousand Genomes Project, uh, it's a project to gather the complete inheritance, uh, the genomes from at least a thousand people. I think they have scaled it now because the cost of doing this has gone down. But, uh, you can try to compare people across countries, uh, continents, and then to do that you can see what it really uh, makes people different, or you can try to look for the genetic uh, um, yeah, how genes can cause, for instance, cancer and uh, diseases. And perhaps, I, yeah, I stopped there. <laughs> <laughs>